All right, thank you. My name's Adam Bradley, and I'm excited to talk about what we've been working on recently, and that is a component compiler. But before we can get too far into the architecture of that, we first need to decide what type of components we're making. And so to do that, I kind of want to go through some scenarios of how we made these decisions. So teams often choose the framework that works best for them. For example, let's say our organization's technology team uses Angular, the Innovation Center uses Vue, and another team uses React. However it plays out, this is a common situation that may be familiar. And I 100% agree. This is what you should be doing for works best for you, yourself, and the team. Now, while teams are choosing what works best for them, we very quickly have this clash, because an organization is made up of many teams. Different projects are started at different times by different developers using different frameworks. And as we zoom out, we start to see a situation that many organizations face. Smaller shops and younger companies may never see the problem, but it also might be that they've never seen the problem yet. So we begin to see the costly challenges which larger organizations face. Now, it's natural to say, well, we'll just standardize on one framework. But it's hard for any one of us to know when to standardize on that one framework. What if we stopped here? Think of all the great tooling that it, and innovation has happened since. Each of these have helped move our industry forward. But how can an organization know when to pick just one? Now, I can't tell you that. And I believe that every team should be able to decide for themselves. But this is something that's very relatable in one of my own experience in helping to build Ionic. Now, Ionic is a mobile-focused UI library for the web. But I don't really want to focus too much on Ionic here. But rather, I want to review the requirements we have as maintainers of this library. Now, it has one over, over 100 components, and we face many of the same challenges that any other team has. Frameworks and best practices continue to evolve and continue to change underneath us. However, the components themselves stay relatively the same. Sure, we update the design, fix the bugs, but that alone shouldn't constantly require a rewrite. Now, building an app and a component library sound very similar, yet in my eyes, they're drastically different. If you're building an expense report app, it's perfectly logical to choose just one framework. It's a self-contained and enclosed application. But as you look at these choices, I ask you not to view these solutions as a way to build an application, but rather you're building a reusable component library to be used within many projects and teams. And you basically need to choose one component model that also matches the same framework as your consumers. In our first version of Ionic, we had to choose AngularJS, and it was a great decision. Then the next version of Angular came out, and we naturally jumped on that and wanted to be a part of Angular's improvements. The problem was that with all that work we put into the original components, they needed to be refactored. Ionic 2 did see many improvements and fixes, but none of those were available to the Ionic 1 users. And at the same time, we were consistently asked by the community to also create Ionic React and Vue. And since Ionic is just HTML elements, it uses CSS for styling and JavaScript for interactions, there's actually no reason why I can't work on all of these. But most importantly, it should work on all of these frameworks too. Remember, it's very difficult to predict what's around the corner. And when that new tech does come out, or the next framework version makes another great improvement, teams should absolutely embrace these innovations. But Ionic is unable to know what's next for our users. But what we can do is build Ionic in a way that we know will work with what's next. First, we need to decide on the component model Ionic would be built with, which brought us to the low-level API called Custom Elements. Ionic extends a browser's HTML element and because of that, we're able to take advantage of existing browser APIs, such as connected callback. So with these features alone, Ionic components are able to manage themselves. And the JavaScript class syntax is written in stone. That's not something that's going to change. It's something that we can rely on. And beyond that, we purposely restrict our components to only use APIs that are provided by the browser. So you still might be asking, well, how is this different? I mean, frameworks use the DOM too, and it also creates elements. The key difference is that a framework manages and controls a hierarchy of elements. It creates, updates, and destroys elements within its own lifecycle events. For a traditional application, this is great. But if we're building a component library to be used within any project, that makes it quite difficult. 
Instead, ionic components need to be self-contained, to have that ability to control themselves, and that's what custom elements can provide. But I do want to be sensitive here in that this isn't another web component talk trying to convince you about them. Rather, I'd like to show how we're using them and what we've been working on to make it even easier for ourselves. And this tool that we use to generate our components is called Stencil. Now, this is funny, right? You just told me all about these frameworks keep changing, and now you just mentioned a new thing called Stencil. But hang with me. If there's one thing that I want to make clear is that Stencil is a build time tool. It's not a framework. The problem Stencil is solving for Ionic is allowing our components to work in many of today's frameworks, and hopefully tomorrow's too. It's a tool to help us generate and maintain reusable components. But it's not inventing or reinventing the way on how a component works. The source of our components use TypeScript. And under the hood, TypeScript has many great features, one of them being custom transformers. In the before custom transform, we're able to gather useful metadata about each component. And in the after transform, we can take that metadata and apply many optimizations to both the runtime and the user's components. We can also use this feature to generate numerous output targets of the same source code. And beyond just generating code, the compiler is able to heavily apply many optimizations after the static analysis. TypeScript walks the AST of every single component and every single file. And all of that information about each component is then used to customize the runtime to only what it needs. So it's more about what the component is not using. And in this example, much of what have been extra code simply is not even included in the component. One way we can reduce more runtime is by adding build conditionals. Now, you may have seen this with like production and development environments, but we can take it one step farther using metadata that we've already gathered. By changing these values to true or false, our minifier can remove unused code. So when I'm asked how large is Stencil's runtime, well, it depends. It's entirely up to which features the components are, are not using. And there are many ways that we can generate the code that helps out our minifier. If we can safely convert a function to arrow function, it does two things. It removes the function keyword, and in many cases, it can also remove the return keyword. Before the modification, the minified output would still have the function and return keywords included. But because we're now using arrow functions and stacking them together, the arrow function is able to turn it into just one constant variable. And I know this seems pretty silly, but it actually makes for a pretty good big difference in the size of the components. And this is actually just one example. We actually do many different things within our compiler to provide different optimizations like this. Now, Hello World app is clearly an artificial example. But for us, it helps us test that the compiler is able to completely understand the component and be able to remove what's not being used. Because of this, the generated Hello World app is 87 bytes. Not kilobytes, bytes. And that's because the component doesn't really do anything, right? So why wouldn't it be that small? Remember, the browser already provided everything it needed to, to work. And the Todo MVC app, which is another common test case, is only 2.2 kilobytes. And if you've been on Twitter recently, you may have seen this demo. This one here is showing that Stencil's VDOM can easily take on the 60 frames per second. But what I really think is cool about this demo is that the entire size of it is 12 kilobytes. And that's mainly because it uses ES modules from uh, 3JS. And the credit here goes to React 3 and Svelte for creating this demo. But I really couldn't help myself to wonder what would Stencil do with this same example. So for a quick overview, ES modules are a standardized module system. And it's already built into modern browsers. So this is the extent of the code required to import and export modules. And I'm not showing source code here. This is the actual JavaScript that's running inside of the browser. Bundling is still very valuable, but it should only be a build time thing. With native support for ES modules, bundlers no longer need to add code into your application for it to work, which is another reason why our components file sizes can stay so small. It offers superior tree shaking abilities compared to CommonJS, and especially with the Rollup Bundler, which is what Stencil uses.
The compiler also makes lazy loading and module bundling easier for developers. It's not that it hides a large configuration file away, but rather bundling is drastically simplified with ES modules. With the metadata, we're able to build a graph on how the components are related. And it uses this information to bundle the components into the most efficient way. For example, with Ionic, an ion list component will pretty much always have an ion item component inside of it. So the compiler is able to realize that, and it makes sure that it bundles them together. And this works well, especially for larger apps, in that it makes for much less network requests. And because we're using ES modules, which the browsers natively understand, we can use features like module preload, for example. Our pre-render is able to automatically include module preload links in the index.html. So for this page, we're already aware of the modules and the app we'll eventually need, but we're not needed them for the first render. We keep those modules out of the critical path, and they're asynchronously downloaded in parallel, but that doesn't block the first paint. But what I really like about this example is that we didn't actually develop anything new. We didn't provide any more JavaScript to make this work. This is, this is something that's provided by the browser. And to be honest, the browser is much easier or is much better at handling network requests than any JavaScript we could have written and thrown into our application. So there's no extra code for this to work. Instead, it's direct from the browser. And I've mentioned output targets a few times, so I'd like to explain further. Basically, we're able to take the same source code and generate numerous builds, the default one being custom elements that can lazy load themselves. But we also generate differential builds that use ES5 and System.js so that the same components can work inside of IE11. But the last two listed here, I think, are the coolest ones. That are framework bindings and Node.js script for server-side rendering and pre-rendering. Something that I've heard many times is that developers and teams are building a design system, and they want to share it with the rest of your organization. And they go through all the work, they build a design system, but then they come to find out that no one is implementing it. And they ask why, and that's like, well, we're using a different framework. We're using Vue, you built it in Angular, or vice versa. We don't know how it plays out, but either way, it's a common situation. They quickly hit this wall, and it's not even that it's just a different framework, but it might even be a, just a different version of the framework. So if you want your component library to be used by different teams, then it's best to follow those teams' frameworks' best practices and guidelines. This means we should be able to provide them with components that already work well in their frameworks. So we quickly realized this with Ionic Angular, and that we need to provide our Angular users with Angular components and not web components. Angular developers expect Ionic to work no differently than any other Angular library. On the left is an example of an auto-generated ng module. This is actually what's used internally for Ionic Angular. However, on the right is how an Angular developer would import Ionic and use it in its template. It doesn't matter that the components are actually web components. To Angular developers, they're using Ionic no different than the rest of the libraries. This includes inputs, form controls, host listeners, and all the other Angular APIs. So this is where I'm not trying to convince you to use web components, because it really doesn't matter um, whether you prefer them or not. Either way, Ionic is able to ship our components to all the different frameworks because of them. The same goes for Ionic React. The left side shows the internal auto-generated components, but this is only something that the Ionic team needs to understand or be aware of. On the right is just another React component. And a React developer would import and use Ionic no differently than a normal React component. For example, the JSX is in Pascal case, which is just the expected way that React works. And yes, web components do work fine in React, but making them easier is another thing that the generated code can do for you. Next is the server side of components. We're able to build a single file with just two exported functions built for a Node.js environment. But what's unique is that while Stencil generated this file, it's not a dependency. It actually doesn't have any require statements inside of it. So this makes it even easier for us to run functions from any Node.js script. This is actually how Ionic components are able to be server-side rendered by Angular Universal. Internally, this is the Ionic server module. Here it's importing the generated hydrate script that we created, and this is also something we're planning to do with Next.js and Gatsby. And lastly, the code being generated does not depend on an external framework. In fact, it's only a dev dependency. For example, this is your node modules directory during development, which looks quite different than probably most node directories, node modules directories. <laughs> 
But more importantly, the components generated have no dependencies, which is very important if you're wanting to build a reusable component library. Now, Ionic sees, I think, a half million monthly downloads per month, and Ionicons, which is another library built with Stencil, um, sees one million monthly downloads per month. But of all of those millions of installs, none of them are installing Stencil, which is basically one vanity metric that we really miss out on. So to recap, you really can't go wrong in choosing a popular framework for building an application. They're all fast, they're all well-documented, they're all surrounded by great tooling. But if you happen to have a similar use case as Ionic, then web components might be a solution to look into. And if you happen to want to have your components shipped into different frameworks, then there's some tools out there that might be able to help. Thank you for your time.